Samuel, and I'm the one reading the word today from book of 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 16, and we read. Sorry? Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's in uh, page 249 of our church Bible. Now we read. When David had passed a little beyond the summit, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of donkeys, saddled, bearing 200 loaves of bread and a 100 bunches of raisin, a 100 of uh, summer fruit, and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, why have you brought this? Ziba answered, the donkeys are, are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for, for those who faint in the wilderness to drink. And the king said, and where is your master's son? Ziba said to the king, behold, he remain in Jerusalem. So, for he said, Today the house of Israel will give, will give me back the kingdom of my father. Then the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that, belong, all that belong to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. Let, the, let me ever find favor in your sight, my lord the king. Verse 5, when, 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 when King David came to Bahurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as, and as he came to curse continually, and he threw stones at David, and at, the, and, and at all the servants of King David, and all the people, and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said to, and sorry, and Shimei said as he cast, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man, the Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has given the kingdom into the hands of your son Absalom. See, you, you evil. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my, my lord, the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, What have, what have I to do with you, you son of Zeruiah? If he is casting because the lord has I say to him, cast David, who then sh shall say, why have you done this? Why, why, have, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, behold, my own son took my life. How much more now may this Benjamin leave, leave, leave him alone and let him curse for the Lord has told him to. It may be the Lord will, sorry, it may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and the Lord, and the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. So David and his men went on the road while Shim Shimei went along on, on the hillside opposite him and cast as he went and threw stones at him and slung dust. And the king and all the people who, who were with him arrived early at the Jordan, and there he refreshed himself. Now Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel with him. And when Hushai the Archite, David's, David's friend, came to Absalom, Hushai said to Absalom, 
Long live the king. Long live the king. And Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your royalty to your friend? Why did you, why did you not go with your friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, No, not for whom the Lord have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. And again, and again, whom, shall, whom should I serve? Should, should, it be, should it not be his son? And I, as I have served your father, so I will serve you. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give your counsel. What shall, what, what shall we do? Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a, a stench to your father, and the hands of all whom are with you will be strengthened. So they pinched a tent at Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now, in those days, the council of Ahithophel gave, uh, gave, gave was as if one con consulted the word of God. So was all the council of Ahithophel esteemed both by David and Absalom, and that's the word of God. Thank you so much, my brother, Ernest, for reading through some of these uh, interesting names. I just realized the other day, uh, my son knows what the process of losing water in the body is called. And for me, I cannot say it. I keep saying dehydrated. So um, <laughs> some of these names are hard to pronounce, but thank you for reading. Um, this morning, we continue with this story in Second Samuel chapter, se chapter 16. I will pray after the sermon, so I um, hope you can be with me. And just because we also have a, a baptism later on, we'd love to spare some time so we can have that in the end. I'm going to read this verse, and then I will pray, and we get into the word. Hear these words that David spoke to Abishai and to all the men. Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now? Sorry. Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjaminite leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. But verse 12, it may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. It may be that the Lord will repay me good for his cursing today. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Uh, your word is a light. And as we have sung in that song before the sermon, we are those who are prone to wonder, to live the Lord we serve. And Lord, we, help, we, we pray that uh, by your spirit, uh, help us through these words to see what your heart is and what you would love us to do, how you would love us to live, as even we learn from the life of David. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, it's easier to endure physical pain. It's easier to endure a lot of harm, even bodily pain, and even diseases, than the pain that is caused by the people you love, the very people who are close to you. The pain that people cause is so much painful. You know, you can carry the weight, you can bear the weight of a collapsing economy, the weight and the pain of disease. But when it comes to bearing the pain that has been caused by people, it is indeed a big thing. Those people you have known in your life, those people you love, those people perhaps even you took from nothing, 
and you brought them in and really they became something. The members of your family, your very own blood, people of your household, your colleagues, workmates, people you have shared life with, when these people turn against you, when these people gossip, uh, they slander you, when these people bring malice, uh, they even swindle you of your hard earned money. Friend, that pain is quite a lot. It's unbearable. It really hurts. Uh, this morning, even as I talk like this, you might be going through that period where you've got people hurt you. People have betrayed you. You think everyone is against you. You are perhaps at a point where you're just wondering what becomes of relationships. Well, this passage is for you this morning. Because right from this story, we, we see what it means to deal with people. As someone has called this, passage is about people problems. And people are a problem because they are sinful. And because they are sinful, they are sinners, they bring pain. So we need to learn from this passage how to deal with pain with heart that comes from people. And uh, maybe you haven't gone through pain, but I can assure you it is a matter of when, not a matter of if. And when it comes, then this passage is relevant for you. You see, we're coming from a time when David has sinned against the Lord. And there are consequences for that. Yes, he is forgiven, but as we saw in chapter 12, the Lord outlines what will come to David as a result of his sin. In taking Bathsheba and having Rhea killed. And last time we saw, we, we are in a section where we are seeing the height of the consequences that David is facing. And last, last, last Sunday we saw how Absalom, his very own son, his very own house person in his own household, has turned against him by rising this conspiracy to overthrow him from the king. David has nothing else to do other than to flee from his own son. So today is a continuation of that. David is fleeing. He's got a bunch of men who are with him a group of people who are following him, but others, it seems, following after Absalom. David has crossed the brook Kidron. We saw in, in, in chapter 15 last Sunday. He's gone up the Mount of Olives, crying, this bunch of people crying as they go, weeping, barefoot, climbing the Mount of Olives. And now here, verse six, uh, chapter 16, we are told now, they are just past the summit, past the summit of Mount of Olives, and kind of coming into the valley as they exit Jerusalem. And it seems really for David, if there is no going back. His own son has overthrown him. He's left. He's at the height of what it means to be betrayed. And so he's going. And his journey, um, as we we'll discover later and in, in, in another books of the Bible, he set towards Mahanaim, which will be his place where he's going to stay for some time. David is gone. Well, in chapter 16, verse 15, and also at the end of chapter 15, verse 37, as David is leaving the city going, Absalom, his son, is coming into the city. And as this is happening, we come to the passage, we meet three people here. Uh, three people that just spell to us, again, uh, the pain that is being caused to David. As he's on the run, he's running. We meet Ziba, the first person who meets him. We meet Shimei, the second person who meets him. And another man called Ahithophel, who doesn't meet him this time, but a man who left him long ago. And I can tell you from this man, it is pain after pain after pain. And let me just say, as before we, we, we go in further, that 
what we see here, David is not just an ordinary person. He's not just not an ordinary character. Yes, there are examples to learn from him. There are examples not to learn from him, like we've seen in this section from chapter 12. But more than that, David is the Lord's anointed. He is the king. So some of the things we see here is not just like we pick something and we run with it. We have to see how does David prefigure the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed of the Lord who comes from the lineage of David years later. And then we can learn from that. So let's dig in, in the passage and see. The first person we meet is Ziba. That's the person we see. And f this Ziba is really a liar. Ziba the liar. The first person that David encounters from verse 1 to 4. As David has passed the summit and, and going uh, into the valley, he meets Ziba. Uh, Ziba is a servant of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan, uh, the son of Saul. And, and if you can just go back a few chapters in chapter 9, you remember where David got Mephibosheth from and how Ziba became a servant of Mephibosheth to look after the, the estate of Saul, his grandfather. And as Ziba comes to meet David, Ziba comes bearing gifts. Look at verse 1. He comes with a couple of donkeys. 200 loaves of bread, 100 bunches of raisins, 100 of summer fruits, and a skin of wine. He comes bearing, fruit, uh, bearing gifts to give to the king. And the king wonders. He asks him, what are these for? Why, why are you bringing this to me? And of course, Ziba has a plan. He tells the king, you know, I, I, I can see you are in trouble. You are really hard-pressed. I brought these things so they can, they can refresh you as you continue in your journey. And the king still has a question, but where is Mephibosheth? How about your master's son, your master's grandson? Where is he? And listen to the words that Ziba answers the king. He tells him in verse 3, Behold, he remains in Jerusalem. For he said, today the house of Israel will give me back the kingdom. Ziba is telling the king that you know Mephibosheth, when he saw Absalom, your son, conspiring against you, he decided that perhaps this is a very good time now for the kingdom to be restored back to the house of Saul. And so he stays in Jerusalem. He sees an opportunity to take back the kingdom. And I think as you hear this, you are wondering something that just doesn't seem right here. Before David came, we didn't know Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was a man living in obscurity. He was a man who was lost in Lodeba, living in the shanties. But now here he is, he's thinking he can take over the kingdom from David. This is bad, don't you think? This is exactly what Mephibosheth is thinking. And that's exactly how David felt. Because you read further in verse 4. David says, Behold, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. On hearing this news, David feels betrayed by the very man he literally removed from the shanties. A man he removed from nothingness to, become, to becoming his very own son, eating his food in the palace. And now this son has remained in Jerusalem thinking that he can take over. This is a feeling of betrayal. And all he can think to do is, now you man, you the servant, go. All that he has is yours. Forget about that man. Go and take the estate. He does that. He responds quickly. But you know what? We can read this in hindsight. You and I will have the privilege of having read the whole Bible. We can see that what Ziba is saying are complete lies, total lies. He's lying because first, he doesn't continue with the journey. 
He doesn't go with David on this journey. He returns to Jerusalem. If really he was on his side, he would have continued with David on the journey. But second, when you read later in chapter 19 of 2 Samuel, when David returns to Jerusalem in verse 24 to 30, he meets Mephibosheth. And guess what? Mephibosheth was unkempt. And the writer tells us that all that time, he had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day the king came back to Jerusalem. And so you wonder, is this the man who was plotting on taking over uh, the kingdom from David? And when the king asks Mephibosheth in chapter 19, why did, not, why did you not come with me? He, he tells the king, you know what? Ziba deceived me. Because I am lame, I cannot go anywhere, I cannot sell the donkeys. He deceived me. And so we discover Ziba is a liar. He's a cheat. He's a con. He's a man who would rather see the poor suffer. He's a man who would rather see the unfortunate suffer, but him, he gains. He's a man who wants to take advantage. Ziba is a man who is thinking, he is the opportunity, he's an opportunist. He thinks, I can go and tell David, yeah, I'm pleading allegiance with you, and I will get whatever I want. And because David is king, he, he will issue a decree. And once he has issued a decree, his son will come in power, the decree issued will still stand, I will have all the wealth that belonged to Saul. He is a self-seeking liar. And unfortunately, sadly, David falls for his lies. And we can understand David as a man on the run. This is not the right time to be told that there is someone again who is against you. Especially someone you have helped all along. So David makes a, a decision quickly saying, if this is the case, then you Ziba take all that belongs to Mephibosheth. He rushes to a conclusion. Here are two applications for us in this point. Number one, don't be a Ziba. And number two, don't be too quick to make a decision. You see, Ziba is this man who is self-seeking. He is a man, as I said, who would rather trample on other people as long as he gets what he wants. Uh, brothers and sisters, in the world we are living in today, we have so many Zebas around. People who would have wealth, who would have gain by whatever means. People who would trample over the rights of others, who would trample over the righteous, the weak, the oppressed, as long as they get what they want in life. They want again. Uh, these are people who are dishonest. People who are liars. And, and I wonder, brother, sister, maybe you may be tempted in this way. As you live in this world today, you're, you're thinking, there's a way I can make wealth quickly. There's a way I can gain advantage over others. There is a way I can rise to the top first. Be warned. Uh, don't, be, don't be like Ziba. Because Proverbs 11, 6 tells us, the righteousness, the righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. This is what we see in Ziba here. He wants, he's lusting after the wealth, and that takes him captive. He'd rather do anything, double deal, deal with David here, double deal, deal with Ziba on the other side, as long as he gets what he wants. That's a dangerous place to be in. But number two, don't be too quick to judge, especially in, in matters that involve other, more than one party. Because what David did is he made a very uh, a rash decision here. And you know what Proverbs 18, 17 says? Proverbs 18, 17 says that the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. That is what has happened here. Ziba has stated his case to David, and in the, in the eyes of David, he is right. He can take all that belongs to Mephibosheth as punishment to Mephibosheth. But in chapter 19, until Mephibosheth states his case before David, you realize Ziba was wrong all along. 
And that is what is happening here. Uh, sometimes, brothers and sisters, in our dealings with people, we can be quick to make our own decisions, to jump to conclusions about people when we feel betrayed, when we feel hurt. Without giving a second chance, giving an ear to other people. I think these are, these are warning for us. As we deal with other people, as we feel the heart that comes out of those relationships, we, we need to be warned that we don't jump quickly into conclusions. Uh, this is a mistake that David makes here. But you know, there's good news because there is one who is greater than David who deals with people in a proper way without being deceived. We read in Isaiah chapter 11, it talks about the righteous branch, the root of Jesse. And it tells us in Isaiah 11 verse 3 that he shall not judge by what he sees or decide disputes by what his ears hear. The son of David, uh, the son of God, Jesus, comes years later and he does not make a mistake. No one can lie to him. No one can cheat him. He does not judge by what he sees or make dispute, resolve disputes by what he hears. He, because he is perfect in knowledge. His eyes are pure to behold evil. You cannot cheat him. You cannot lie to him. And that should spell a warning to us. If we think we can go in the way of Ziba, lying, cheating, our king, the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, cannot be cheated. He is of perfect knowledge. He sees through every lie. If you're living a lie all your life, be warned. There's one you cannot lie to. Uh, the son of David, Jesus, uh, the son of God. He sees through every lie. Number two is Shimei the accuser from verse 5 to 14. Shimei the accuser. As David continues on the journey, after, after, having, dealt, after having met Ziba, he meets uh, this man called Shimei. We are told it is in a place called Bahurim. And this Shimei is a man who is a descendant of Saul. So he comes from the lineage of Saul. But here's something interesting. And I want you to picture this, because David is kind of walking in a valley, and the place he's coming from, there's, there's a kind of a cliff, a raised area, and this is where Shimei is standing. And as Shimei sees David, he picks up stones, and he starts throwing them at David. But more than that, he's also cursing David, hurling blasphemous things at David, Saying an imaginary, unspokeable, to David. But here's something interesting. It seems maybe Zibash is a strong man. He's a very courageous man. That he can do such a thing. Or he's a fool. Because we are told David is surrounded by his soldiers to the, to the, to the right and to the left. And here there is Ziba throwing stones at David. Oh, Shimei. There is Shimei throwing stones at David. He's either a very strong-willed, courageous man, or he's a fool. How can you throw stones into a beehive and think you'll survive? And guess what? One of the guys with David is his nephew called Abishai. As, as this guy comes, you know, fumbling, mumbling all these words and cursing, Shimei, you know, is tired and he just tells King David, let me go and get his head. Why should this dead dog keep cursing? Kichwa tu, kichwa tu, let me go and cut his head. Uh, and by the way, Shimei, no. Imagine a in Changaya. What am I saying? Abishai. Abishai is capable of doing that. Abishai with his brother Joab, they can do that. They don't need even a command. They just need David to say, <laughs> and, and Shimei will be gone. He's dead. He's, his head cut off. That's what is happening. But I'm just to get the weight of what Shimei is doing here. 
You know, sometimes English doesn't bring out the force of the curses. You know, when someone, you know, kutusi, abuses you in your mother tongue, it is a very serious thing. But he's saying he's cursing. He's cursing the king. Listen to these words, what Shimei is saying in verse 7. Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. You can think of that in your mother tongue. Toka hapa, toka hapa. Or sometimes in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the politics the other day, Maliza Wende, Maliza Wende, that kind of thing. That is in Greek, actually, what he's saying here. And he's saying, you are a worthless man. Mutubure. When you of you. Pumbavu. That's it's serious. When you think about it. And cursing, saying other many blasphemous words. Many other words you cannot utter. And cursing him, perhaps cursing David's generation. Calling all manner of curses upon David. And, and making this accusation. He's telling David, you are a man of blood. The Lord has avenged you on all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. He is cursing David, wishing the very serious, very whatever evil you can think of on David. And that's why Absalom, uh, uh, Abishai thinks this man just needs to be dead because some the, the things he's saying, it, they are not true. Because David did not kill anyone of the, of the house of Saul. David is the one who went and sought Mephibosheth and he gave him everything that belonged to Saul. Otherwise, it would have been wasted. David is the one who mourned at the death of Ishbosheth. He did not go about rejoicing that. But listen to what David says. David does not tell Abishai, Please go ahead and cut his head off. He tells him, what have I to do with you? Verse 10, sons of Zeruiah. If he is cursing because the Lord has said, him, said to him, curse David, who then shall say, why have you done so? Verse 11, and David said to Abishai and to all his servants, behold, my son, my own son, seeks my life, thy Absalom. How much more now may this Benjaminite? Leave him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. What David is doing here, he casts himself upon the masses of God. David acknowledges uh, the sovereignty of God. Beyond the cursing that Shimei is proclaiming upon him, David casts himself upon the Lord, the sovereign Lord. He's even acknowledging that the Lord has told him to. And there's something that is happening here. It, it seems we are getting a bit of the old David we knew back here. Not the same one who was there, uh, you know, uh, engaging in adultery and murder and not repenting. It seems you're getting a bit of the old David back. You remember in chapter 15, verse 25 and 26, when the, the, the priests bearing the ark came to him, David told them to go back with the ark. And in verse 25 and 26, David told them, if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it, that's the ark, and his dwelling place. But if he, the Lord, says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do what seems good to me. David casting himself upon the Lord, relying on the mercies of God, praying and trusting in God. And then in chapter still 15, verse 31, remember when David learned that Ahithophel was also part of the conspiracy. How David responded? He prayed to God, Oh Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And now here, he's here again saying, Leave that man alone. Leave him alone. 
and he prays to the Lord saying, Oh Lord, look upon the wrong done to me and do good. Bring good out of this cursing. You know, David may not be guilty of the blood of Saul and all his descendants, but he knows in his heart he's guilty of blood, the blood of Uriah. He's guilty of other sins. He deserves the cursing. He deserves to die. Yet, he knows there is one who can bring good out of the cursing. And so he turns to the sovereign God and prays to God that God, even through my own sinfulness, even through the cursing of Shimei, could you please, God, bring out good. And it's, it's good for us, brothers and sisters, to grasp how God is sovereign in good, in bad, in evil, and in everything. Because if you do not think that the Lord is sovereign, even in evil, even in bad, then when suffering comes, when hurt, when, 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 you know, when um, betrayal comes, we'll not be able to stand. It's a bit of like what um, even Joseph said in Genesis chapter 50 to his own brothers who had betrayed him. His own brothers who meant harm to him. Remember what, they, what, what Joseph told them at the end? When they came and they were reconciled, he told them, you meant harm, but God meant good. So that it may result in the salvation of many. That this one person was cursed, but it meant in the salvation of many. I think it's the same thing here. David is telling us, yes, if God wills that I receive this curse, let it come upon me. But out of this, God is going to bring out good. It's, it's, it's like David is living Romans chapter 8, verse 28. That everything works for the good of them that, the love, that love God. Those that have been called according to his purposes. That is what we're seeing here. A, a bit of now getting us to understand what passages like Hebrews chapter 12 means. That yes, David is being disciplined by the Lord. But as you read in Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 5 to 8, how it tells us that we do not take lightly or despise the discipline of the Lord. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. We are not to regard discipline lightly. But we have to endure discipline. For without discipline, then we are illegitimate children. We are not really the sons of God. David understands this is his lot. I think he's showing off more of Christ here as he submits himself to the sovereign Lord even as, as he is being cast, even as all these accusations, wrongful accusations are coming upon him. Yes, he's not perfect. He's a sinful man, but he casts himself upon the perfect, righteous, holy, and sovereign God who works all things for the good of them that love him who turns even evil into a blessing. Uh, that's what David, uh, David is doing here. And, and brothers and sisters, this is the story of the greater than David, the Lord Jesus Christ, the descendant of David himself. Remember when Jesus came, his life was marked with this rebellion, uh, uh, being people marking, rebelling against him. Not that he was a rebellious one. He was marked with him being rebelled. His friends deserting him turning against him. You remember that time Jesus was in the Samaritan villages in the book of Luke chapter 9 and the Samaritans rejected him. And one, uh, two of his disciples, the sons of Zebedee in, in chapter 9 verse 54 told Jesus, why can't we call fire from heaven upon these people? And Jesus was like, you guys, he rebuked them. You sons of Zebedee, what is wrong with you? It's kind of the same thing. What David was telling Abishai, you sons of Zeruiah. He rebukes them. Jesus knows his lot. He suffered. He underwent tribulation. He was cast on the cross. He received curses upon him. They mocked, people mocked him. Soldiers mocked him. As he walked, people were spitting on him. As he was on the cross with the two thieves beside him, he was mocked with one of the thieves telling him, oh yeah, you who served people, save yourself. I save us also. Jesus 
the Son of God went through suffering, went through mocking. He took the curse upon him. On the night of his arrest while in the garden, as the soldiers were coming to him, remember Peter taking the sword and cutting the ear of one of the servants? And Jesus told Peter to put the sword back. I think David is showing us what Christ is and what Christ, who Christ is, what Christ came to do. And we can learn from David as we learn Christ Jesus. And let me read a passage that I think drives this passage, this point home and really applies to us. Come to me to 1 Peter and in chapter 2, which will be our application for this passage this morning. 1 Peter and chapter 2. This is what the Word of God says. And I'll read from verse 20. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to you, for to this you have been called, verse 21, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. David was there before this man who is cursing him. David knew he had all the powers, but David did not even threaten. Jesus also suffered on the cross. He suffered in this journey to the cross, but Jesus did not threaten when he was reviled, he did not revile back. He did not answer back. He endured. He went on the cross, dying on the cross for you and I, so that we can be saved. God using that and bringing good salvation for you and I. And Jesus is here as our Savior, but also as an example. Because if you are his disciple, this is also your road, that we are to walk on this road of suffering, responding to insults, responding to hatred and heart that comes our way in the same way like the Lord Jesus Christ responded. Brother, sister, when you are treated badly, when you are betrayed, when you suffer in the hands of other people, how do you respond? They might have a reason. The reason may not be genuine. But how do you respond? Are you that one who offers threats, saying, Utanijua? And we know those threats are empty. Listen to what Peter tells us about Jesus in verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Friends, our God is sovereign in our suffering, in our pain, and he's the just God. We can entrust ourselves upon him through whatever treatment we may go through as, as a result of working with him, as a result of standing for our faith. Because we know in the end he will judge justly. Friend, we can trust in God, even through the deepest pain that we can face. We can trust in the sovereign God. And he's the third person, Ahithophel. Ahithophel, the betrayer, the traitor. I'll not spend a lot of time on this, uh, because I think this section from verse 15 is really uh, setting the stage for what is coming next. Uh, in chapter 17, I think it's setting the stage for uh, the battle of wisdom that we're going to see in chapter 17. 
It's kind of a trailer, a tester to what we'll see. And so from verse 15, there are these two people, one of them, Hushai. Hushai now comes to uh, and meets Absalom. But we know why Hushai is going to Absalom's side. It's because they have a plan with King David. He has a task. He has one job. His one job is to be the answer to the prayer that David prays, that the Lord will turn the wisdom of Ahithophel into foolishness. Uh, that's why uh, this guy Hushai is there. But I want you to notice something here about this second man, Ahithophel, who is the third man in our passage this morning. Look at verse 23. Now in those days, in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed both by David and by Absalom. As Ushai is in the camp of Absalom, he knows exactly what his task is. But the question is, is he equal to the task? Because look at how Ahithophel is before Absalom. Absalom asks him for, for advice, for counsel. And straight on, without even blinking, without even thinking, Ahithophel has an answer. He tells him in verse 21, go into your father's concubines, whom he has kept to, be, to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a strange to your father, and the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. Ahithophel is really bent on finishing David. He is really bent on completely Kumaliza. He's there now. He has switched sides. Remember, he was David's counselor before. But now he is with Absalom. And he has got one job, is to destroy David completely. And he's a man who is endowed with wisdom. He's a counselor. Whatever he says we are told is like as if it is coming from God himself. This is what David is up against. And to make matters worse, this man who is now advising the enemy, David's enemy, was his friend. He was his closest associate. And look at the kind of wisdom, the kind of advice he is giving Absalom. Is that Absalom would go and sleep with the concubines, his father's concubines. Now, this is a, 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 this is a trick that was used by kings then. To show that a king has taken over a kingdom and exerted his rule was to take over the women that belong to the other king. To sleep with them. In Kenyan lingo, think of it this way. A politician going to a stronghold and getting votes from that stronghold. And we say, I'm in your bedroom. <laughs> Absalom has done what? I'm in your bedroom. This is what he has done. He is here completely finishing the dad, the king, asserting himself as a king. Remember on one hand, that is the judgment of God in chapter 12. This is what the Lord said. Judgment, that what David did in secret will be done in the open. Absalom heeds Ahithophel's advice. A tent is set up on the roof of the palace, presumably the same place that King David walked as he was seeing Bathsheba bathing. And now here, Absalom lies with David's women in broad daylight in the sight of all Israel. And this kind of the last nail on the coffin. He, Amanda, for David, there's no hope. But friends, think about David when he hears this. This will be the most distressing news for him. His very closest associate has turned against him. Him who knew him inside out, him who would advise him, he is now advising his enemy. And you can tell now, the advice he gives his enemy would really finish David at once. Uh, commentators have said that David had Ahithophel in mind as he was penning Psalm 41, which is really a psalm of lament as David is facing enemies and crying to God for help. And especially verse 9 in Psalm 41, David says, as crying to God, 
Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. This is Ahithophel, his closest friend. He has now become a traitor. He has now become a betrayer. In other words, Ahithophel has become Judas Iscariot to David. He has, come, he has gone and betrayed the king. And at this point, you're wondering, that prayer that David made, O oh Lord, please turn the cancer of Hithophel into foolishness. Is this ever going to happen? We'll see that in chapter 17. But what I want us to see is the height of betrayal, uh, the height of, uh, you know, of betrayal that David feels here by his closest associate, who has now gone to the other side and is using his knowledge of the king to really defeat him. But friends, even through this, God is working good, as we shall see in the coming pages. But I hope we can see what the king is going through. Being betrayed by his own, being hurt, being humiliated, being cursed, being ridiculed. And the way he responds, the first one is not really in a good way, but the second one is a way that we can all learn from. And friends, let me just ask you as I bring this to a close, how do you respond when you are betrayed, when you are hurt by people, when you are ridiculed, especially for your faith at the workplace, wherever you are, even in your family, how do you respond? I think we have a lesson to learn here, to entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. We can do this because we learn from Jesus himself, who entrusted himself upon him who judges justly. And Jesus went through pain, he went through heart by his own people. It was because of your sin that Jesus was nailed on the tree. And Jesus endured that. And through that, God worked salvation for you and I. We who are the followers of Jesus, we also walk that path of heart, of pain. But God is with us even in that journey. I finish by reading this. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. James calls us all believers this, that count it all joy, brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I want us to pray. I want us to pray. And, and, and perhaps you're not a Christian, and you're just wondering how this can be true. Well, the point is, if you haven't encountered the mercy of God, the salvation of Jesus, you, you, you do not know just how deep your sin is and how much Jesus went through to save you. It's only when you realize that that you can, f you, you can know the sense this makes. If you're not a Christian, you may be walking in the way of Ziba, using others, just thinking about what is gained to you. Or walking in the way of Shimei, cursing the very one who came to save you. Or Ahithophel, just wanting that which is yours, and in so doing, betraying the very king who came to save you. Uh, this moment, you can ask the king to forgive you, and he will. Uh, the king will not cut off your head just yet as he did with Shimei. You can trust him, and your head will be spared. But you know what? A time is coming when if you do not trust this king who died for you, then for sure, your head will be cut off. But if you're going through pain, through suffering, through heart, a heartache, first as a result of being in faith or being betrayed by others, I want us to pray. And if you are not a Christian, I want us to pray also together that you may trust in this God and walk this path that he has called us to walk. 
I'll give you a minute to pray, and then I will pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray for us, O oh Lord, as we walk through these days, that, Lord, you have numbered for us to walk with you. Days that will be filled with sorrows and tears and a darkness not yet understood, walking through the valleys, traveling through it. And sometimes we don't see any earthly good. Lord, we pray that help us through the pain and the heartaches and the heart that we see and we go through in this world, especially for the sake of the gospel. Help us to look to Christ who bore it all for us, that we may bear it all for his name. I pray for those of us who are going through a period of betrayal, a, a time of uh, a broken relationships where people have hurt us, I pray for your mercies upon them, that they will see the comfort we have in the gospel for a, of a king who suffered for us, that we can bear the pain now because, Jesus, you bore the pain and you have given us an example. Help us to count it all joy even when we meet trials of various degrees. Lord, we pray through all this, may you work good, that we, you may call us to endure to be patient, to be steadfast, O Lord, that we may be complete and perfect, lacking nothing. And I want to pray for those who have not yet come to a point of seeing the reason you, Jesus, died for them, that through this word, may they just see the gravity of their sin, what they are doing to the king, their own being self-seeking, their own cursing the king and taking him back to the cross when they continue in their rebellion. Uh, their own betrayal of the king who died for them. I pray that, Lord, would you work on their hearts, that they will run to you, you who says that you will not cut off their head. I pray that, the Lord, they will see what you have done for them and run to you in faith. Lord, we want to thank you. May you help us to be those people who are living like you, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen.